zero. Why is it zero? They're like, oh my god. <laughs> Where do I click? Paralyzed users. Now, while I've showed you a LinkedIn one here, there's actually a much better use case one, but I can't get the original version of the box of it. There's a, you ever use those online maps? So the story actually where this came from is from a company called MapQuest. MapQuest actually started off back as a, a Cornell at Cornell, uh, Cornell University as a dissertation project. And it had phenomenal GIS technology. Really fantastic. Way ahead of its time. And it was only being bought by one real, two groups. One was the US Democrats, the other was the US Republicans. And they used it for this process we have in the US called gerrymandering, which is redrawing district lines so that you have more people in, in politics on your side. That's it. There's only two people. And he's like, well, this is a great technology. What should I do? So he's like, maybe I should build a web demo. The web was starting to come up. Web demo. I should put something on the web. So I put a web demo, and it had this thing where it said, find a map. See what's there. <laughs> Not too different from what you're seeing today on the web. It's very much the same product. Now, what happened there between having this super, super sophisticated GIS system and this kind of boring system? Well, what happened is the boring system was the maximum technology that people could have. When you look at Google Maps, interesting thing happens. People still to this day don't always realize that you can drag in there. They're waiting. They need to put a hover message in there that says, Hey, drag, and you can actually move this. You don't need to just click on the arrows and do other stuff. So even creating a sophisticated or increasingly sophisticated product, you have to be very careful with the paralysis you put in front of the users. It's very easy to test. Just hold it up in front of a user and say, what would you do? And they go, uh, uh, that's probably too much data. But it's really amazingly easy to be a data person and start saying, well, that other product was stupid. <laughs> you want all this but it doesn't work. So, precision and recalls. Be very careful. Your precision and recall ratios need to be flipped when you're producing data. If you try to show somebody a crappy result, then it's gonna go bad. Here's my recommendations, which you can't fully see for, for uh, Amazon with the collaborative filter, and there's this, all these blogs that show like, here's a crazy result that Amazon gave me. People who bought this, you know, people who bought garden hoses also bought those studded <laughs> collars or something, right? And, and it's, why does it happen? Because the data is just too sparse. But if it happens, you need to create great bailout flows. And then if these are ads, and the beauty about ads is you can have a lot of recall. You can have huge distribution because the users are okay with seeing marginal ads. They're used to that. So you don't have to have the high percentage. You may not get the high, a great click through on that, but you're gonna have, it's, it's not gonna, as soon as you do this with uh, putting out data in front of the person, you really risk pissing them off. And that's that's that jujitsu. So I'll take questions if you got. Them. Or not. It's kind of like the the who viewed my profile. I stunned everybody. <laughs> Uh, yes. Can you this project? Yes. Yeah. So this one, so I'll explain this from, a, from a, another project that you can actually go get your own version of this network graph. So if you go to LinkedIn Labs, there's a project there called InMaps. And this technology that, that looks like this is you can also, if you're trying to build a network uh, map like this for any data you have, there's a technology platform called Gephi out there is uh, one of the co-founders of the project is Matthew Bischon, who is also the uh, guy that put this map together. And you can go create your own at LinkedIn. And, it'll, and what it does is it takes your, your LinkedIn connections, it uses no other information than your, just your connections, and it looks at it to actually figure out what these clusters should look like. So what's amazing about this, so this cluster right down here, that's my LinkedIn cluster. That, I think, is my eBay cluster, if I remember correctly. These are different parts of Silicon Valley. Uh, down in here, this red, is the data cluster of all the data scientists. Uh, up here are people I used to work with, academia and other places. Uh, so it, it does a great job of, of that clustering. 
and, and colors is a so, so, source of this. They're just individual uh, clusters. Yeah, so you can, pardon? By type, by type or connection? Uh, well, no, not, not, not type of connection. No, there's no information about that. All this uses is just the fact that there's a connection. Mm. And then it uses the topology of the graph to figure out what those clusters are. So it says, hey, these guys are all connected one way, these guys are connected another way, these guys are connected in a different form. Topology is the structure. Think of it as the, the structure of the graph. So it's actually a really, really cool one. And actually, if you have any type of network graph that I highly recommend just throwing it in Gephi and playing with it. You'll see all sorts of great things. And for visualization, it's a great early way to actually interact with your data to get a sense of what's, uh, what's really happening with the data. Any others? What about the future predicting series? How do you uh, remove nurse results in there? How do you do that? Just manually? Uh, so there's a fair amount of manual cleanup. Right? And then once you see a pattern in the manual, the, the manual results, you can create a heuristic that looks for a very similar type of patterns. Mm -hmm. And so basically what you look for is sparsity beyond a certain level. And they say, wow, OK, that sparsity range looks really bad. You also use the data, actually, to help clean it. So you say, is this a good result or is this a bad result? And then people say, oh, well, that was terrible. And then you go, OK, we better probably rip that out. Or put it in for manual review so that somebody else can say, you know, is that good or bad? For example, in my life, you know, I went from academia to government to industry. People might say, well, that's a terrible result. <laughs> uh, other people say, wow, how do I make that? How do I make that transition? I want to, I want to be able to take that transition. And so it is actually an extremely, extremely difficult uh, challenge of how to actually deal with that data. But it's not online? It's online. It's, 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 it's out there. It's, a, it's currently available to students only. Uh, it's Career Explorer. And there's actually a number of videos out there that walk through all the functionality. It's, it's actually a really, really cool, cool project. So um, let me inter yeah. interrupt with mine. Uh, so there is uh, quite a bunch of talk of uh, differentiating between uh, product development versus customer development. And this idea is that maybe traditional product development starts from a technology and trying to find a customer for that technology, and the customer development starts with the customer and trying to find the right solution. So how is how is this huge uh, area of knowledge uh, working with data uh, connects with I'm quickly understanding the customer. And, uh, so, like, <coughs> combining being fast and at the same time getting real interesting insights. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that's a, that is a really good question. So there's the... It, it can happen from both sides. Let me give you a couple different... Two examples of, from very, very different sides. One is, in the Career Explorer case, that was one of the 90-day projects we have for all the people that come into the into LinkedIn. It was like, well, what, you, what are you going to do in your first nine days? And they got to get familiar with the data, and they said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I just did this? And they did it, and they got an early prototype done. And we said, wow, that was really, really cool. I bet a lot of people would be interested in that. And so we started talking to people, and they said, wow, that would be phenomenal. And especially after the economic collapse had happened, people realized, wait, we really need a service like that, because people are trying to transition industries. Conversely, the one that, that we saw was, um, was uh, around systems where you, for example, when one product goes out and they say, well, how are we going to get users to discover our product? We know we have a new product. They know that they've done all the market research, and we need to funnel a product to them. And then we say, oh, well, we could build a very lightweight functionality to help funnel products, like with a lightweight recommendation engine like the groups you might like or the the, the vents you might like type thing. You can take that to even further extremes where you say, hey, wow, we've done this market research or there's, there's this customer that's asking for this. What, what's the best way to do it? And that's effectively what things like who viewed my profile or other things are. In fact, what I would say is it's even stronger is a lot of these recommendation systems are somewhat fairly natural from a user perspective because if you say, you go to any movie rental site, you say, well, I looked at this movie, 
shouldn't you be able to tell me what other movies I might be interested in seeing? When you look at services that recommend re or rate restaurants, shouldn't you be able to say, hey, I ate here, tell me all the other places that are also like this, whether these are interesting. Uh, all that type of, I know that I have something and I go to other things, all of those become very, very natural from a data perspective. And so, to some extent, there's a lot of the stuff that's been done that you can just take literally uh, a, a page from that playbook and apply it to your site and your systems. People have taken people who may know and applied it to all different types of places and, and put these out there. I think what what's get, starts getting really interesting is how do you take your data and put your own twist on it for your business and apply it to get these things. I would have never expected these guys to, at Zynga to figure out that translucent fishes are you know, the, a good use of data, but it turns out it's a brilliant use for them. Cool. You just, yeah. Uh, what is the future of data science? Uh, what are main trends right now? Or how is the food of food fight? We're slowly taking over the world, so that's easy. Uh, <laughs> I, I think one of the, the first thing is happening is it is easier and cheaper than ever to, to do analytics. That's the first thing. The second thing is e the, the type of organizations that are starting to use data in new ways is moving very quickly. You're even seeing large, large institutions like financial, big banks even starting to use data in novel ways. You're also seeing the ability for very small mom and pop businesses, like the local pizza place, to start using data around Google Analytics or being able to look at their financial transactions, to look at how they're spending data. Or even as a personal finance, there's these now systems, one of the early ones was Mint.com, and you're seeing these other ones that allow you to actually analyze your own travel or your own personal, or even your own health. Like quantified self is a big movement where people are looking at bio information. You can take your, uh, your iPhone, and, which I left somewhere, and, and you can actually look at it and say, what is your, what's your heart rate? You know, get very fast feedback. So as you get more and more data, what do you do with it? And there's something that I think is, which has been one of the big problems is, it's very easy to produce what I call data vomit, which is, here, look, here's all this data. Well, we saw it paralyzes the user. It's useless. So how do you now make that data useful, I think, is the next big step. Not just in web properties, where we're starting to really get a good handle of that, but in everyday life. Great, so I can tell you the temperature in this room all the time. What are we going to do about that? The understanding that, taking it to that next step of not just having some graph, but actual actionable things that we can, do. how does that make your life better? Build, building insights that come quickly. Still very heavyweight, expensive to build insights. But I think that's going to change very, very quickly. And how to understand which things make uh, life even better? Testing. I think it's a lot, a lot of testing. And you know, I think there's a certain amount of, if you try, and this is very much the Silicon Valley paradigm, if you try to build a solution that is solving a problem you have, there's a good chance there's a lot of other people that have that problem. And so if you're just really fundamentally focused on, how do I make life better for me? It becomes very, very natural to say, oh, okay, then I should, that's probably a good product. That's a, that's a good thing. Flycaster was a, uh, a good example. This is a product that, you know, there's this problem of saying, is my flight going to be on time or not? <laughs> Shouldn't it, you know, it turns out that's actually a really, really hard problem because you've got to parse these flight logs and they're really in horrible formats. But once you do that, you can build a really great product that actually shows you about the probability that you taking this flight landing on time. And what is the way to understand uh, long time? long effect of um, some things because uh, some decisions or some uh, changes uh, can have effects through the long time. Yep, absolutely. How to uh, find those things? Yeah, so really important question. The, the number one place where I see that that goes wrong is people aren't monitoring at the detailed level enough and asking very sophisticated, hard questions. Because the equivalent of that problem is, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm in a business where the environment is changing very, very rapidly. 